Jenkins, Kelly Zelinsky, and Jim Howard. And I will let you take it from there with the support of David Heyer with the power. Enjoy. Uh, glad to see you all here. And uh, this is a panel discussion. We're not going to take turns. We're going to, well, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, but I am told that you may interrupt. But that's, that's Jim's idea. My feeling is okay, but make it short. <laughs> All right. Uh, the other thing, uh, the program represents a lot of research. Uh, all of us have spent hours at the Maine Historical Society uh, looking at the Central Maine Power Company archives primarily. Uh, we've been doing a lot of good research. We, went through all the town reports and pulled up some very interesting things. We went through Grandmother Pottle's letters, which were in Callie's attic, and found some interesting things. So it's been a fun project. Uh, we in the process of doing this, we prepared uh, what, a four-page timeline of elect electrifying Otis Field. There are a few copies left uh, when we finish with the Glad to have you take them while they last. Uh, my first uh, introduction is, I, I'm supposed to be doing the clicker. <laughs> okay, uh, that is uh, sort of a familiar thing. I wanted to find some way to get you people interested in this. And lo and behold, the advertiser Democrat have their uh, question of the week on what's the most important invention uh, and I, I thought it was interesting. Maybe you've already seen this, but let me go over these. The first lady said eyeglasses. The second person said cell phone. <laughs> okay, well, she obviously can't get along without her. The next person said the oil furnace. And my reaction was, what fires the oil furnace? The electricity, of course. And then Ed Lyons of Oxford said the wheel, which was probably the best answer of them all. <laughs> anyway, uh, electric heat again, and plumbing. And then electric lights. Finally, we get to a really correct answer. <laughs> and electricity from the man from Woodstock. Uh, the water pump. Again, that is something. Uh, we all have, we take it for granted, but it is electric, I think. And the grocery Poland of which stock voted for the automobile. Okay. But I'm going to, uh, this is kind of a diversion. I don't talk about myself, you're not supposed to do this. But I'm going to introduce you to a very remote village in Massachusetts which had no electricity until 1950. How many of you have heard of the Quabbin Reservoir? Aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. Well, I want to do the go. Let's see if I can highlight this. I'm having trouble. <coughs> well, I gotta forget, forget, forget the point. Uh, that's the reservoir in the middle, and 122 is at the very top of that reservoir. I grew up very close to 122 in the very northern part of the reservoir. The reason our village, the village of North New Salem, the reason our village had no electricity until 1950 is that it was supposed to be part of the Guadalupe Reservoir. We were in a valley, it was supposed to be flooded like four other towns in the Guadalupe Reservoir. Uh, it did not get flooded, but they decided not to put electricity there because it probably would get flooded. Uh, then World War II came along and uh, no one was interested in putting up electric lights. So my sister and I for years took the school bus from North New Salem and went three miles uphill to New Salem where they had lights. And then we would go back to things like that. In that we had a, we had a uh, the ice man's. I remember ice truck came once a week. 
this is not the stout, but these were not, <laughs> this, this is not in the wash tub. And I, I uh, these are not good, the good old days for me, <laughs> but uh, I certainly lived through it, I think, for it, more than most people in this room have. Except for Elaine Dobel Beryl, who is going to come up next and talk about her experiences of life in Otis Field without electricity. Elaine? Well, I didn't have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Jean gave me five to ten minutes, so I wrote notes. If you, if you know me, you know I can get distracted. Do you want her to come this, come, come this way? Uh, you're Much better. Yes. Am I good? In 1977, Don and I lived at Ryefield Bridge, which is in Otis Field, and we had a fairly new house. We had all the conveniences. We had about three acres. We were new parents to our oldest daughter, Andrea, who now goes by Shree, different story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we had, uh, I don't know, did I say we had about three acres? We had a, a pretty good sized garden. We had two dogs, two goats, some chickens, some pheasants. We were really looking for um, something with more land and so we could expand our garden and uh, get into, I don't know if Don would say homesteading or not, because he was teaching, so I think a real homesteader has to stay home. But um, we were looking for more land, and I was at the uh, Norway, uh, South Paris actually, um, Farmer's Market, and Mary Van Ness told me about this place in Otisfield that was for sale that was kind of primitive. And I wasn't quite sure what she meant by primitive, but I found out. Um, so we looked at the land, and we live on what's now Hidden Lake Road, but then it was called the Harlan Swamp Road. Not, not as sexy as Hidden Lake Road. Uh, we'd gone by this house many times, hundreds of times, because Don worked at the Great Oaks Camps, and we lived at Rifle Bridge, and there was this old white cape up on the hill, and I just thought rich people who, who lived there in the summer and didn't think much about it. So we go up in, you can't see it from the road, but there, there are about <coughs> seven to ten acres of fields, and there's an apple orchard and a big barn, and there are outbuildings of animals. If it was the circular 1830s house, that part didn't thrill me, but the land did, the field especially. I was in love. Well, <clears throat> it was $25,000, and in today's money, that was about 103000 I looked that up. Um, it was, it would be worth twice that much, the man we bought it from said, if we were to have electricity. So it didn't have electricity, it did have a generator, an own generator, five kilowatts. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Big one. No storage system. Um, we could only afford to run it an hour and a half every other day. So in that hour and a half, uh, and I would always turn it on during Sesame Street because that's when happy hour is at the girls needed to be occupied while I could vacuum and do the laundry and it's my most unfavorite thing. Fill up five gallon pails of water from flushing the toilet when our generator was not. Um, let's see, what else did we do? We had uh, we had a gas stove, we had a gas refrigerator. We uh, that first year we put in gas lights in the two main rooms. Um, I hung clothes on wooden racks in the winter and on clothesline in warm weather, and I'd probably still be doing that, except our daughter became a massage therapist and had to wash a lot of sheets and dry them a little fast, and so we got a dryer. Um, yeah, that first year, we, uh, yeah, we ate by candlelight. I washed dishes by candlelight. 
we did explore some alternative energy. Um, we, we did have some solar panels. Um, we found that windmills were too expensive and too complicated at that time. We, uh, I bought John a battery operated TV in, in 1983. I was going to grad school, so I was pretty busy studying, and he missed his sports program. So this little black and white battery operated, I think, did we use the solar panels to operate the batteries? I don't know. Yeah. Charge. Yeah, charge. Um, we liked it. It was quiet. All we could hear was like the hiss of the, the um, gas lights. And now, you know, we have electricity now. <laughs> And we have the, the refrigerator, and we have a water pump, and oh, all these noises. I don't, yeah. Well, once in a while, we get to re-experience that, you know, when, when power goes out. <laughs> Aren't you, you know, I want to say, I kicked the TV habit. You know, that was, that was big to me. That saves a lot of time if you're not involved in that. My children learned to entertain themselves. They spend a lot of time with paper and pens and pencils and paint and a lot of time outdoors and they totally miss that whole music video thing with all these sexy shots. They miss that. That was a really good thing. And you know, both of the girls are proud that they live without it. When we first moved there, I thought, well, this is, this is nice for now, but when the girls get older, you know, kids like kids, we're going to have to move into town to be with other kids. But it didn't work out that way. They loved it. They loved playing in the orchard. Each tree was like a, one was a bank and one was a store. You know, they had fun outdoors. They loved nature. Um, okay, I lost my train of thought. That wasn't in my notes. <laughs> Oh, I wanted to share this. Um, when Andrea was in second or third grade, the nuclear waste dump was a nu nuclear power was an issue. And she remembers, I remember, taking her to the town hall on Bell Hill. And she wrote a letter to President Reagan. And, and she told in text, she told, in purple crayon, she did this. Opposing the nuclear waste dump, she said that we live without electricity, and other people can too. <laughs> and she said that you know she, I asked her if she felt less than because we lived without electricity, even though it was by choice. We didn't have to do this. And she said, absolutely. She said, seriously? Are you kidding? We were proud of that. We wear that like a badge. I mean, we were. She said, I was proud of it, I will always be proud of it. And that little letter writing campaign over there, that was a formative uh, act, she said. And she's, she's an active environmentalist today. She's a, a biologist. And Rebecca is a, a, um, an artist, and you can see in her work, strongly influenced by nature. What I learned is you get used to your inconveniences. I had always thought that Americans are spoiled. I still think that. Um, I think I wanted to prove to myself that I could do this. It was sort of like back to the land, back to basics. No big deal. However, it did take not two years before people moved on to the road and we got elected. It took 11 years. So, um, I think the last two years I was working, and it, it was much harder. I think that uh, it, it was definitely a good experience, um, and, and I don't regret it. But I also know that I was blessed that even though Don worked as a teacher, it was enough that I could stay home if I was if we were frugal and live on one one salary, and not everybody has that that option. The road improvement was a huge thing in us getting electricity. I didn't tell you, when we moved there, uh, I don't think it was after we bought the place we found this out, 
Probably so. His memory is better than mine. Um, CMP went $5,000 plus $95 a month for five years. Well, that was not in our budget. So, yeah. No big deal. We can do this. So, so we did. Well, it was five years before the next person moved on onto the road. Um, we had no neighbors a mile in either direction. There was Raymond Johnson, who was on the corner of, of um, Rayville Road and Carmel Swamp Road, and Oral and L, who was up on the Gore Road. And there were no neighbors in between. The road was not passable, heavy clay. Um, Richard put in the warrant that next year, I think it was the next year. We, we moved in November 77 um, <clears throat> to in, for funds to improve the road from the Gore Road to our house. I remember sitting about in this area with a lady in back of me speaking up at the town office and she thought that anyone who was, implication was foolish, enough to live out in the boonies, they ought to just be able to deal with it. Well, I am very grateful that our road commissioner, Richard Bean, said that it was his goal that every person, every family in town should have at least one access, exit out of their place. And so they made a, um, a, a road to our house that stopped at the bottom of our driveway. Um, there are many stories about people getting stuck using our phone, no cell phones, of course, but we had a phone, so they did use that. That first winter, in, at the end of March, it was Easter, we went to my parents uh, in Kingfield in a big snowstorm. We could not get back in. The rope, we just couldn't get back in. So we ended up staying at uh, Don Spokes, who lived on the corner of Bow Street in, in the Gore Road for, for two weeks because there was no phone. I was willing to live without electricity, but no phone, two little kids, isolated, no. No. So that, that was good. They helped us out in a lot of ways. Um, <coughs> Oh yeah, Don. Maybe you can tell about the the, uh, the wheelbarrow story. I think. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, right. We got electricity December 29, 1988. Rebecca and I were uh, sitting at the kitchen table playing a board game. We did that a lot. And um, yes, they came up. And I gotta say, it was a happy day. <laughs> I mean, it was um, it was a good experience, but things like you know having golden toasted bread, you know, in a toaster, like it, it didn't burn on the stove, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and you know flipping the switch and having a lot of services. I mean, life really is easier with electricity. Okay, our next uh, speaker is going to be our, um, our uh, electrical expert. We also have a licensed electrician in the audience, so watch what you yeah, say. I'm trying to trouble. figure out some way to send him outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trade him this just to oh, information. this with a quick fact. My brother and I, when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old, we used to, well, our hobby was to get old wooden boats and fix them up and try and sell them. And they were good, what, what I call mud flat, is because you sold them when they were sitting on the mud, okay? And then you suggested that uh, if you owned it, you wanted to return it to the mud so the water would come out again when the tide went out. So we used to sell all our boats with a 30-30 guarantee. 30 feet or 30 seconds. And the science of this presentation is very similar to that. Okay? But I thought. Okay, I'm, okay, we gotta come back this way. Now, all my toys are over there. Oh. Can we go over there? Yeah. Okay. Boys, boys can't do this with their toys, right? 
So, very briefly, I'm just going to say that the world is made of atoms. You've got a proton and a neutron in the middle, and then around that you've got an electron. All right? Let me show you sort of a magnetic electron. If you get a chance, these are two magnets off the welding bench. All right? If you get a chance, try and stick them together. Okay? Or turn them around and try and take them apart. All right? Now, you can't see what's going on there, but something's going on that's preventing these two magnets from both getting together directly. All right? So, a couple people made some discoveries. This guy, Michael Faraday, uh, electricity's around us. When you were, I could do it, but I lost all my hair. You can take a balloon and you can rub it on your hair, and then you can stick it on your sister's, you know, sweater. Or, of course, the ben Benjamin Franklin part, when certain conditions ha happen in the atmosphere, the electrons all get excited and they create lightning. You can mix chemicals. You can actually mix chemicals. You can do it in a dry container called a Class D battery, right, size D, and you can create electricity. Or you can do it in a box about this big with some lead plates and some chemicals. Open your hood. There's a supply of electrons in that combination that you're using to start your car. This guy had a really good invention. He discovered that if you took copper wire and you put magnets around it and you spun the copper, all right, the electrons jumped off. All right? We know they're there. All right? Here they are. So you put a bunch of copper wire together, if you spin that wire, it will spin off the electrons. There's an interesting thing about copper that I learned when I was preparing for this. Now, magnets like some things, right? They won't travel through other things. Copper is a very interesting item. There's another more time we would do an experiment, but the electrons run too thick. But the electrons actually ride around copper wire. I learned that making this person. Am I okay here, Jeff? Am I still alright? Okay, I'm waiting for you to just go. No, 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 no. <laughs> and don't hesitate, all right? Because this is my first time, at, you know. You're good here. Uh, so far? Okay. So the electrons actually ride around the copper. So when you think about it, you take some magnets that have got all these electrons around them, all right? The electrons don't go in the copper, they get around the copper, and you can spin them off. Great job, great job. Now, one of the facts about that is, and here's an example if you get a chance. This is not a spinning one of what he made, but this is one of these, this is big in the 80s. If I shake this, there's copper wire and a magnet. The magnet is going back and forth across the copper wire, okay? And it's collecting some electrons as I do it right now. Hope this works. And you can see from just a little bit, we got a few electrons to go through the light. So this guy had a really good idea. And what he created was called direct current power. Power. Right? So that was really, really good information. Next one. Where's the uh, oh good. And then uh, along comes this guy by the name of Thomas Edison, wonderful fellow. He figures out, and it was kind of, a, electricity was really interesting, but it wasn't running the world. He figures out, after a lot of trial and error, how to take some electrons, move them through some, you know, some very thin wire, and they'll glow. And this is basically what he did right here. This has got a few more little pieces of wire in it. But when electricity goes through that, they don't burn, they would like to, but they can't. They glow. And from what I understand, check me here, Jeff. From what I understand, the magic of this is really simple. They taught us in fire school it takes three things. It takes a source, it takes something to burn, and it takes oxygen. So he had a lot of light bulbs and he put the old electrons to it and went poof. He removed the oxygen, created a vacuum inside the bulb. So the electrons go all ready to burn up the little tiny wires and something's missing. So they sit there making a bright glow and that was the beginning of the, of the light bulb. And people really liked it. 
you know? The gas lamps are kind of hot to handle, the oil lamps are a little funky, you know, smelling. They really liked it. So, he was a big advocate of the light bulb. Now, there's another, there's two types of ways that electricity travels. One's called DC, or direct current. The other one's called AC, or alternating current. This guy created alternating current. Now, I'm going to get a couple people here to show you the difference. One, two, three. You right up here. Okay. So, let's imagine this is the generator. Okay, and if you're all face that way. One, one behind the other. Okay. Here's the generator. And at the bigger the generator, the more electrons, here we go. So, I'm a DC generator. What's great about a DC generator is, now put your right hand on her shoulder, put your right hand on that shoulder, and everybody push. Okay? We're all pushing in the same direction. There's a lot of power when you get everybody pushing in the same direction. The trouble with this, and Edison loved it, okay? He loved it. He was a big DC guy. He got a lot of publicity because DC only goes two miles when everybody's pushing in the same direction in the 1800s. But one of his customers was the New York Times. So he was always saying, it's got to be DC, it's got to be DC. That's how we should, you know, do the work. This guy comes along and he figures this out. Remember, the electrons aren't in here, they're just riding on the copper. And if you look at a generator, it's got more than one magnet. So the magnet on the right side can throw an electron to this side, and a magnet on the other side can throw it in the opposite direction. You can basically bring it around and connect, connect them. You know what that creates? Now turn, right, face forward, face forward, face forward, that way, right? <laughs> now, remember, I said electron went left, electron went right. It's called alternating current, and it's really doing this fast. But it's going this way, it's going that way. And it's going this way, and it's going that way. The great thing about it is it can go a much greater distance. Electricity can travel much more than two miles when this guy came up with alternating current. Okay, hey, thanks for your help. Thank you. Thank you. So, I want to mention a couple, so that's a, that's a ground rule, okay? A couple of things to remember as we talk about this, about how you, you got to get it. You got to figure out how to deliver it. First, you got to get it, all right? Remember, let's make a business selling electrons to people. So we figure out a way to create them. We create them by, in main, water power, all right? We create them, we already got mills with belts turning all kinds of equipment. So what we can do is we can use all of that water power to turn the generator. So a couple of key dates. In 1850, all right? Now, we didn't have any, we didn't have any alternating current. But in 1850, the pioneer in Maine wasn't in Bangor and wasn't in Portland but it was a small wood mill in Oakland, Maine, where they used their dam to create this new technology, right? For a 225 kilowatt electric generator, they could light for their plant. In 1880, in Willamette, Maine, the woolen mill at Greenleaf Falls had the first incandescent electric lights in Maine. So, um, it was starting to catch on, but in the 1990s, a writer for the Lewiston Journal worried that the use of electric street lights would uh, uh, prevent the trees from sleeping. <laughs> so it wasn't over. Right? But it started to catch on. There were, the fact of the matter is, by the late, or the, by about 1890, there was a fair number of electric generating plants. But remember, they're water powered in most cases. And in fact, a little side, but I read later in some CMP stuff. This area was um, nine months of the year water power and three months of the year steam or something else. But it was really, you know, we, we had a lot of the, of the falling water to create electricity. And uh, there are two things that we're going to talk about um, from this conversation that was going on in the late 
1800s, that's going to come back and visit us a little bit. Um, and at the, at a little bit later, um, Gene and I will talk about a significant program in the 1930s called the Rural Electrification Act. But I want to stop a second on this little conversation about electricity and talk about two other pieces that were going on that tie together when the picture starts to come forward. And the first one of those is our good friend, Alexander Graham Bell, and the telephone. Thanks. So Kelly's going to do that. Okay. Um, but first, for most people in this field, in Maine, for that matter, probably in the country, the first live example of electricity was not a bullet mill, it was not an electric light bulb, it was an electric railroad. Now, this stuff, I don't know how many of you realized it was a trolley operated by a generator that ran. 2.1 miles from 1895 to 1918 from the Trolley House restaurant, that was one end of it, in Norway, it's now a brew pub, to Market Square in South Paris. The tracks ran right down the middle of the road and they carried a lot of people and it made a profit. There were railroads like this all over the country in small towns like, like this one, or Norway, and in large cities. They, people walked to, this is before the car, it was a cheap, easy way to get around. What happened? You say, aha, the car came along. No, that wasn't it. What happened was that the owners of the electric railroad, and you, that generated, that's what generates the power for that railroad. Well, did. That's still there. It's, it's deep frost. Anyway, uh, the problem was that the Oxford Light Company became Central Maine Power. You've heard that, I'm sure. They didn't want to run a railroad. They wanted to expand the electricity. They saw more potential in that. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, well, another problem with that railroad was that it could only go one direction. Am I right on that, Jim? So it had to reverse 2.1 miles to get back. It had power stores at both ends. It had a terrible time with snow because it had an immobile plow. It just sat on the front of the engine. And the result was that they spent an awful lot of time shoveling the track. It was not a practical thing, but it made fun. But still, in 1918, uh, the Central Maine Power Company people, or maybe their predecessors, I'm not sure what the name of the company was, uh, pulled the track out before they had approval to do stuff. <laughs> they decided that was the end of the railroad as far as they were concerned, and sure enough, it was. Fortunately for the people of South Paris and Norway, the automobile came along shortly thereafter. Okay, and that is a big piece of this puzzle. You don't think of it, you don't remember that. Uh, Callie is going to talk about the, the, what Jim was calling two components of the big electrical revolution in Otisville. One is the telephone, which came first. Yeah, um, think about it, the telephone was here quite a while before electricity was. And Otisville started preparing for that um, late, late 1800s, early 1900s. And it was very interesting how it occurred. Um, there were basically three companies that started to lay down poles and wire <coughs> coming from three different directions. So when the power goes out, we'll get the power eventually because it kind of went like the homes did. When the power goes out, we all wonder which, uh, let's see, where, what line am I on? When are they going to get to that tree across the line? And it's kind of confusing about how the lines run and still run in Otisville. The first um, one I want to talk about was 
started in August of 1901. The town gave a permit to um, the Bolsters Mills Tell and Tell Company, I'm assuming that's Telephone and Telegraph Company, to construct telephone lines through town. Um, the lines that came, that were going to appear at Bolsters Mill, probably came through Bridgeton and Harrison to, to Bolsters Mills, et cetera. <coughs> Uh, so that, that started and they, they had some um, phone poles, if not white wire then, um, but they marched through with the poles first. Oh, just leave it be. <laughs> um, then in the next year, 2019-2, uh, there was a company called, uh, well it was called company actually, it was called Herman C. Cook and others. Not quite sure who the others were. Uh, but they were given a permit. So the town was kind of pacing along and saying, let's get this going, let's get this going. And um, that company uh, was uh, permitted to construct a telephone line upon the highways of Otisfield. That's from Spurs history that some of this was found. Uh, that that uh, telephone line was probably coming from Poland through Casco, and maybe perhaps up Maybury Hill, uh, eventually to the Powhatan Road, and went as far as the um, Nutting House that's now under restoration. And it didn't go any further. And um, then there was a third line, and that appeared in April of 1903, and that was the Oxford and Otisfield Telephone Company. And they were given a permit um, to construct telephone lines, so they had to put in poles first <coughs> on the roads in Otisfield, but it doesn't say exactly where in Otisfield. So that came through from Oxford and Otisfield. The president of that little company was my grandfather, Harry Stone, my dad's uh, father, <coughs> and um, his partner in crime was George B. Turner, who was originally from Otisfield, but then moved on to Oxford. So they, they set up their telephone company and they started to proceed this way. And they went as far as just be on the Bell Hill Road turn. There's a big white house that sits up on the left, I think it's a boat mm -hmm. that lives there. It's really the, I don't go back, 1770 or something. Um, but uh, it, went, it came all the way through town and stopped at that house. He arrived at that house, and that was it. And so it didn't go on to the Nutting House. That came from Poland and Casco. So it was a little bit confusing. Uh, I, it was interesting, uh, I think this came from some of Gordon Peacock's <coughs> okay. um, There was, uh, they actually, actually offered stock options for this little Oversfield Oxford company, and uh, George, Knight in 1908 purchased uh, a share, number 73, um, of stock. So how that all went for him, I don't know, but he, they were up and running and had their little company. Um, so you can see from that that it really was a matter of all of these things com becoming confluent, and getting the act uh, together. There was. Um, there was a switchboard in Poland, and they allowed Otisfield to be part of their switchboard. So ultimately, we got we started to get telephone service. Um, it was a little bit beyond that. It was past 1980. It was in 1938 that Poland added Otisfield to its switchboard so that we could communicate further afield, I'm assuming. So, they put up poles and kind of set the way for the electric wires and Jim's going to spend a bit of time on maps and how things actually uh, came through. So that's all I have to say about that and you'll see me later. Uh, Jim is going to, I think, Jim, are you going to talk a little bit about uh, how electricity spread into town? Yep. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were going to or not. And Dave, can you put up a map? Do you need more people to act for you? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get some telephone poles up or something. <laughs> 
As a quick aside, if you go to the main historical society on Congress Street in Portland, they have 189 feet of information that CFP donated. And the, and the uh, uh, index is 300 pages long. So when you go there, it's great to have, it's, it's great to have Gene Hankins with you. Because in the course of getting to the maps and getting pictures, I remember he is, right, it was, I was going home empty handed until I said, well, my mentor is Gene Hankins out of Otisville. Oh, well, maybe you can take some photos. Hey, <laughs> name drop, but thanks for the help. <laughs> so, this is from a 1924 study that CMP did. And unfortunately, it's this big, because I ordered a bunch of maps. It took them some time to bring them over. But it had some blue lines on it. And those were existing power source, power lines in 1924. Then some red ones, and then some green ones. And the red ones, I think they've been added in, you know, as done eventually. But they originally were people who had people, customers of more or of two or more customers per mile. Right? And then they had green ones, which was one customer <laughs> per mile. And that was what they were looking at. But I'd like to go back a little bit and give you a little bit of research that I did when I looked at maps on power plants. In other words, remember who's making electrons. I started making electrons to push little DC projects and push DC railroad. Okay? That went by the wayside by the early 1900s. So it turns out when you get to this era, there's the Bridgeton and Harrison Electric Company. Oh, pretty neat. Now, CMP is going to take all these over, okay? But if you go back historically, in fact, they owned them when they drew this. But if you look at the history, there was falling water in Brisbane and Harrison, and they were generating some electrons. There was the Cumberland County Power Light Company. So think about Casco, right? And then there was also the Oxford, Oxford combined with Mechanic Falls in the very early days. There was the Oxford and Mechanic Falls Power Light Company. Now, CMP, and they did a great job, frankly, of finding falling water, seeing the potential where dams could be put in, and buying up companies. So by the time we get to the early 1920s, CMPs got the ball. All right? Well, what's interesting to me is, if you think about it, <coughs> there's power available in Harrison. Well, we can sell it where? To Bolster's Mills. There's already there's already telephone poles from the phone company. Now, I can't find a, a direct contract where CMP you know, said, we're going to use the poles. But it fascinated me that um, there's also a telephone company coming out of Oxford. And gee, look at this 15 years later, 20 years later. There's electricity coming off that side of the network. Okay? And here's Portland. We used to be part of Portland. So let's go to Casco for a second. Portland Power and Light, Cumberland County. Great. Got some phone poles. So I started to look around town. And I did learn this from driving around. You know, if you go out of Casco on the Powhatan Road, you drive all the way to the end of the Powhatan Road, and if you, just before you get to 121, you look to the left, you will see that the poles have been cut through the woods onto 121. But you say, oh, but I see a pole ahead. <clears throat> That's the last one you will see. It goes to the big nutting farm, all right? So stop at the corner and turn right. Look up. There's no electricity. I'm not talking about 1920. I'm talking about today. When you go to the nuttings and you drive up 121 towards Oxford, you will see electricity when you get to that big square house, uh, oh, the booms. There's one new house right in behind that, and they put a pole in, and you can say, oh, he's got a new pole. He got a new pole, they gave him electricity, but there's nobody living there, okay, from, uh, from that big square house to the nutty house. So, now let's go, so let's imagine that the power came down the Powhatan Road, went around the corner, and headed towards Spurs Corner. So I said to Lenny, I said, Lenny, where do you get your power? I get it from Spurs Corner. I said, do you think it goes all the way to Bolster's Mills? He said, it didn't for years. He said, there were no poles 
after Big Hill coming out of Bolster's Mills for years because nobody lived there. So I went to the, I went to the store, I went down, bought a cup of coffee and said, when the power goes out at Spurs Corner, do you care? And she said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> we get our power from Bridgeton. Oh. I said, I'll be darned. Right? I'll be darned. That's why, oh, telephone poles, that's why I have a connection in my head between telephone poles from 1988, 1990, generating sections in these different areas, and where do you get your electricity? Now, try as I could, the colors and the, and, and I tried to photo different sections of the map, but as you can see, this is the bolster, this is the uh, line that goes, that blue one was one I could tell that that came out of Casco, okay? And went along what's now the Powhatan Road. Ah, uh, that one's a given. Some of the others, now, Holster's Mills was glued up, so that had power a long time. Um, and my hunch is they were getting the issue from Harrison because it wasn't coming from, it wasn't coming from Spurs Corner and going down. Um, let's see, Holster's Mills all true. Yep. Um, and I talked to Frank Blauvelt because he worked for Arcadia for a long time. And they were, you know, they were pretty stylish camp. I thought, well, maybe they got early electricity. He said they had it when he started working there, and it came from Spurs Corner. Oh, so it went all the way around Spurs Corner, and at least as far as Camp Arcadia, in terms of the, the Powhatan line feed. And uh, I talked to LJ about, uh, about uh, Big Hill, and I went to look at the corner of the Nutting Farm, because I, I, you know, sort of thought, it's got to go one way or the other, and by golly, it goes to Spurs Corn. Um, so, um, can I mention the bean thing? Um, they talked to uh, oh, oh. Richard Bean, yeah. Richard Bean Sr., mm -hmm. and because he's up on the top of the, of the hill, and I'm figuring the power's coming down from Oxford, was my hunch, for the bean farm. So I went to see him and I said, when, when did you get electricity? He said, well, he said, I was old enough to remember, but too young to be on a shovel. And I said, well, tell me more. So he said, the power was at the corner of 121 and the Bean Road, and his dad and, and the men dug their own holes to get the power up to the farm. And that was about 1938. Wow. So here's the terms of how that fits. How far is that? A couple well, miles? I, yeah, I should have measured it. I, and he said his uncle, who lived past him at the time, put in his own hole and had to run his own wire. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's kind of interesting how you get there from, from here. So, thank you. Okay, Jim, that's good. Um, I think that brings, uh, brings out the point. I'm going to turn this over to Callie in a second. I just want to make one more comment. It, it explains to me why my mother in law, sitting in, in Tiffany Hill Road, could not talk to her cousin in the Nutting House without making a toll call. They were in different lines. <laughs> and they did not call each other very much. Kathy's <laughs> uh, going to pick up and we're going to go from the general to the specific and talk about specific cases of uh, specific families for whom we have records. Uh, uh, when how they got electricity. Uh, Jim's already talked about the Bean family. This this is where <coughs> the cake with uh, used to be Ethel Turner's before that belonged to Eva Elliot. Uh, that she was talking about. <coughs> um, this was there. A couple of things happened at once. One down at the cake, and then uh, also on our road, which is across from the Cape, on Stonehurst Road. And uh, that was my grandmother's farm, that followed. And they both had, we found an application for the Cape, as well as the application, this is the one that came was in my attic, uh, along with a lot of other things. <laughs> and um, it, it is the application for electrical service. And it, uh, uh, in consideration of expense incurred by the company making necessary extensions to its line. So like um, beans put in their own poles, that sometimes you had to pick up the tab for having the poles in installed. Uh, the undersigned agrees to take and pay for said lines to get electric service hereby applied for. The undersigned agrees to take and pay uh, 
service for a period of five years from the date on which the company is first in readiness to render said service. So they're just putting up poles and lines at this point. And um, you'll pay the company in accordance with its published schedule of terms and conditions, a minimum charge for said service of $2 per month. So that was the charge to get hooked up to uh, Central Main Power to get prepared to have electricity in your home. And that was um, in October of 1929, and it was the same time just about for the Cape. It was 1929. Well, the Cape um, was owned by Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Eaton and Elliot. And uh, why, you know, why did they, they got service almost the next day? Um, and why did that happen? Well, for one thing, they were fairly wealthy people, and they had the money to get service and probably buy some things to run off that electricity as well. So this is, you can't see it very well, but uh, she's talking about, uh, you can't see it at all. This is Arthur Bean. Oh, this is Arthur Bean. Well, Arthur Bean was the caretaker of the camp. He kind of ran the place for the Elliots. And this is Mrs. Elliott's diary entry, which you can see. And you can see it was cloudy, and we went to Lewiston and bought a washing machine and a refrigerator, et cetera. And then um, she paid somebody for some painting, um, Eastman and George. And then on Thursday it rained, and et cetera. But they had the first electric lights on that night. So they went the night before, 1920, uh, uh, on the 19th, and they came home with their refrigerator and their washing machine, and they had lights. Oh, what a contrast! And this was the the first lights in Otis Field. First lights in Otis Field. So that was them. Then uh, my grand, my grandmother. Uh, she had a little no grandmother in the middle. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, I should introduce my family. Yes, that's my grandmother and my great grandfather, Mr. Pottle, and my uh, uncle, Molten Pottle, and his first daughter. Uh, that's my house where I live. Um, she wrote a letter, as she was inclined to do. I don't have just one letter. I have a leather suitcase this big by this big by this thick of her letter. And uh, she said, she's writing to my mother, who was probably at Colby College at that point. December 1, 1929. The electric power poles are set, but no wires strung yet. Ethel Hurst, that was our neighbor, right across, for those of you who've been up my road, it's the little brick house up my field. Ethel Hurst and I are going to Norway tomorrow to prod them up a little, see if they can get wires. <laughs> uh, Ethel's brother, Guy Scribner, is going to make the cement base for the pump tomorrow. And he says the pump can be installed after it hardens a few days, and then we shall want the power. I can't have any wiring done this year. And I'm sure she couldn't because she couldn't afford it. Uh, her husband had died young, and she was a widow, and so she was just planning to get the uh, what was important about the pump was um, that prior to that, of course, they all had old hand pumps on the kitchen sink. Uh, but the power, the uh, water, there was a well down below the lawn in the field, um, and it, it served both houses, their house, the little brick house, and our, our farm house, this one. But the pump was in their basement, so for years, uh, we had one well, one pump that served sort of like this in the place across the road at one point, did the same thing. Um, so they worked together to get that done, but that would have been a marvelous addition with cattle and all of that that needed to be watered to, to have the pump. So that's what it meant to um, Annette. Then she also uh, left some, this was the bill for wiring, no, oh, this is the bill for wiring. You have that, and you can see that to get the wiring done, and I'm assuming that's from the bottom of the road on up, was a happy sum of $100. Well, back then, $100 was a fair amount of money. Um, but then they also had done their shopping, and these are some of the things that uh, they bought, and you can look at the price of those. A spread light lamp, and I have two of them, and I think those are in the ceiling of my old upstairs hall. They're a round, circular lamp with them all screwed in the middle. And then two small um, pin-up lamps. 
Okay, those are still on the wall. That's in the front <laughs> hall. Jeff, you know where it is. <laughs> and it wasn't uh, brushed bronze at that point, because when I changed wallpaper, I, it, they were kind of a, a aluminum color, you know, just a very plain little thing. But those are, all of those lights are still there. And then a sunbeam iron master, I think it says. Iron. Know, it's an iron. It's an iron. A starlight toaster, <laughs> electric hot plate, because we even had a wood stove, um, and standard lamps, probably four, I don't know, floor lamps maybe, or table lamps, likely. Uh, and then a wall case and a 9990 receptacle, I think, and a 7094 receptacle plate, and a half an hour of labor. That was for $18 wow. <laughs> So that's the kind of how the cost of no washing machine. No. no washing machine. Well, we had two, one of those old ice boxes for a long time. It was after World War II before we got a refrigerator in our house. And they, like you say, came up with an ice truck and lugged the ice in. Um, so, and these are some things that I brought. This was the top guy that is called the Blizzard for obvious reasons. This one went out to the barn uh, before you had its light. Um, this one was either on a horse drawn or regular automobile. But I think it was on the carriages. And whether, it, you know, if you've been to Quebec and done the Plains of Abraham, you see them hanging these on the back of the wagon to let you know there's somebody either in front of you. I don't know. I can't open this. I can't figure out how to open it. But it's not electric. Oil or whatever. Is that this for heat or light? It's a light. It's the lens is here, and whatever was producing the light is in there, and I can't get it open to see. So if anybody can get it open, they can. There were two of them, so they had one on either side. My dad was going to wire those and hang them on either side of the garage door, but like get it done. And then this is the classic old kerosene lantern. This has got uh, just lamp oil in it. If you want to see it? Show and tell. Mm -hmm. Put that on. They didn't have those then. You have to, no. No. You have to uh, mm -hmm. keep them clean if you want to get any light. Mm -hmm. Now we've used these many a time. There's a whole line of them just up the stairs. We a long, low shelf. And there were probably six, seven uh, lanterns there that we used from the power mill. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of history there. These are, you all know what they are, they're the, the insulators that went on the poles. This little guy, I remember we had one on the side of the side of the barn. You put it on a surface and then put wire around here and lead it to the chicken house or whatever you were going to do. But, so they had these, all these little gadgets that went along with electricity. Uh, the other one is the diet. And we don't know a lot about this except this, the earliest house that was there. They had that set of buildings burned as well as the more recent demise of the, the dire place. But you can see there's a pole there. And we don't know just what that was. Maybe they would, had some pole, but it's right up in the yard, if you can see the tallest thing there. Um, and I don't know if anybody gets to talk to Gary if he even knew anything about it. No, I've never seen this picture before. That's yeah. the reason I wanted yeah. to put it up there. Yeah. Uh, everyone thinks that this is, this is, of course, before the, there have been two fires since then. It took the whole place down yeah. four times. Yep. Yep. So that was. But I, I if, if, uh, thank you, Karen. I guess, yeah. Are you done? I think so. I was going to tell you about Richard being. Um, Doing the, the, you know, them digging the poles, but you already did that, so I will, I better blow this up. Okay, I just wanted to um, say that the 1936 date is important. It's not a coincidence that these last, the, the, the father's house was, was electrified in 1936, and so was this. 1936 was the year that the Rural Electrification Act was passed. This is part of FDR's Depression Era legislation, which really changed America. It made it possible for families like the Pottles and the Dyers, and probably most of Otisfield, 
to get electrified. Uh, the bill provided for uh, local electricians to do the work, and it specifies standards. Um, have, you got, have you got that? I, I seem to have the wrong draft. What? I put from my notes. I've got an earlier draft. The, um, okay, I'm going to read this to you because um, the electricians serving on the REA, the Rural Electrification Act, crews added wiring to houses and farms to use the power provided by the line crews. Standard REA installation in the house was, and this is interesting, Jeff Cohen may understand this better than I do, a 60 amp, 230 volt fuse panel with a 60 amp range circuit, a 20 amp kitchen circuit. We checked those figures and they're correct, according to the source. And one or two 15 amp lighting circuits, one outlet per room with ceiling mounted light fixtures. Now, my house is 1888 and it has a light fixture in the middle of every ceiling and it has one wall socket only. And so it sounds pretty familiar. And I brought in. Um, some little plugs that we used to screw into. It was electric light dangling from the middle of the ceiling. Yes, you lay the saying, oh, right. And you could take out the light bulb and screw this in and it plop. Yeah. And, and it was not very safe and not a very good system. But my house had them when I moved there in 1958. So. Okay, coming back. Um, anyway, 36 is when the, a lot of the houses got electrified. I'm going to let Jim tell what happened after that. Mark, I wasn't ready. The schoolhouses are still dark. One of the things that we did is uh, uh, we went to the town archives and went through the town reports. And in, in uh, the town report, uh, the annual report in 1937, um, the superintendent of school was a, a Dr. Adele Lombard, and she submitted a report. And now she talked a little bit about the fact that the stove pipe at the Spurs Corner School needs to be taken down and cleaned, and that might be a problem as it's riveted. There's a problem with some of the plaster in the back of the classroom. And then, then she went on, and, and in her report she wrote this. I just liked it so much. It was like, okay, I'm in town meeting, and I'm, well, how am I going to vote here? You know, how am I going to vote? Let's let's figure this out. The week of February 20 to 26 has been designated as National Save Your Vision Week. Reports show that one out of every ten pupils suffer from serious eye defects. This number is greater than it should be, and may be reduced by giving a little attention to the lack of sufficient light in some of the schools during the late hours of the school day and in the last months of the year. There is probably no greater vision taxing period during one's entire life than that time when the individual is earning their education. Much can be done to improve the present conditions with a reasonable financial outlay when the citizens of the town feel that they can afford to install electric lights in the schools. Perfect vision is a precious gift and far too precious to neglect it or has it the parcel, partial or complete loss of it. Thought devoted to this problem will yield satisfactory returns. I think the Central Maine Power Company furnishes a consultant for lighting schools in the latest and most approved way, using a light meter to determine accurately Ooh. the number of foot pan, uh, candles of light necessary under the con conditions. Mm -hmm. And she closes with, please visit our schools and so on and so forth. So, welcome to the town meeting. Mm -hmm. After someone wrote that, how would you vote? 